What's coming up? You can skip ahead to the message if you want to. I'll give you the minute mark. Good morning, Owl Rock. <clears throat> Patricia will be here in just a minute. And uh, we are trying to uh, plan a little bit of a trip. Let's do some announcements. Um, we hope, assuming that all the COVID stuff goes through like it's supposed to, because they don't let you take the test in advance to go to the Bahamas. You have to take it within three days. It won't even let you sign up, you know, until three days before. So we took it yesterday and we got our fingers crossed that we'll be able to go down and uh, to the Bahamas, to Nassau. That's Patricia's home and we hope to see Jay down there get married. That's her nephew. And um, we're looking forward to that. Um, so we got a lot going on. That's part of why she's a little bit late, but she'll be here. So um, let's take a look at our announcements. We are pleased to have Jim back at the organ, at the keyboards this morning for our Laity Sunday. And Paul is going to be giving us uh, a reading with our responsive reading in the Psalms. And she's going to pick one. Don't, don't pay attention to the one that's there. And um, Patricia might sing. I'm hoping. Got her down there. Um, this Wednesday, January the 26th, I'd like to invite you to go ahead and, and um, be ready to go and see Jean Martino at 11 a.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Central for his Bible study. I normally plan to be there. I'm not sure what's going to happen this Wednesday because I don't know about our trip. We will have just arrived down there. I might be able to have Wi-Fi. We'll see. But I don't plan to try to do the Wednesday night pound. That's too much with me being in a new location, I think. Could change my mind, but I don't, I don't think I'm going to try to do that Wednesday night. Now, for next Sunday, with us being in Nassau, we have uh, asked the Reverend Winston Skinner to preach for you next week. And some of you, I think Jim knows who he is, he preached the eulogy at Lynette Suttle's funeral, you may recall. Yeah. So he has agreed to come, and I hope we give him a good warm welcome, and uh, um, I'd like to plan to give him some thank you money too, if you don't mind, David, and make him happy, and y'all have a good worship service next week, and uh, we'll watch you from down there, but uh, I'm, I'm not going to be taking notes, because uh, I know how hard it is to set this stuff up when you're gone, and you don't know who's doing what, and but I'll tell you what, Paula and Sarah, if anybody can set it up, probably they can. They're pretty savvy, and I just showed them how to do it, and I'm going to make her an administrator and let her, so those of you who are listening at home, she's going to press the button, and hopefully we will be just live streaming as normal next week, and I'm just going to leave this stand right here, okay? It'll be where it is. You don't have to set it up again. I appreciate you two doing that. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Um, any questions or any other announcements? Yes, sir. Uh, I have a check for eleven hundred dollars plus, which I left at home this morning. Um, and also, um, it's almost double. It's almost double. Wow. Excellent. And the more that's in there, the more it can accrue potentially. That's good stuff, man. No, that was really a good thing we did. We got to put more in there maybe. I don't know if we have any more, but it would be great to put some more in there. It's awesome. Um, any other announcements, questions about this coming week? Will you join me in prayer? Lord, for the people who are with us right now, watching live in their homes or wherever they are, we ask your blessing on their hearts, open their eyes and their ears, 
to experience you anew and to feel our prayers and presence with them. We pray for everyone gathered here and those who could not be here today. For those who are watching the recording, bless them as well. Allow us to be challenged and maybe even interrupted a little bit in our everyday lives to wake up to who you are. Reveal yourself to us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, well, our opening hymn is Standing on the Promises, 374. Let's stand together and sing, 374. historic affirmation of the Christian faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. concerns. Um, uh, 
We're still uh, praying for the pianist at Mount Gilead, Kimberly, goes by Kim. I heard from um, her husband saying that the nurse had called him, you know, they got protocols in for COVID right now, so he can't like spend time with her, but he did talk, he talks to them every day, and he said that um, she is being weaned off the oxygen little by little. She did get the tube out last week, and now she's being weaned off the oxygen in there. Um, Breathing, breathing stronger on her own, and that's the goal, but it's COVID, and she's she's really fighting. Um, I don't see her here, but I'm adding her. Um, also, um, I've got a cousin that I, I met through, uh, just a cousin, sort of, that I met through uh, Ancestry, and she, right now, is going through um, medical complications due to the COVID vaccine. <coughs> so she's uh, been dealing with it for about a year. And uh, she had, I think, some sort of procedure this week and has more tests coming up. So prayers for Crin and uh, prayers for Jonah, my friend in uh, South Georgia, who's got a lot going on right now with her health and family. Um, and just COVID issues in general, that's on our list, of course. Um, is there anyone on here that you need to uh, give an update on, or maybe someone who could come off, or, I don't know, um, someone to add? Yes. Um, I just wanted to give an update on Ms. Van Um Ms. Is she on here? Yeah. I'm, I'm, let's say the name again, please. Doris. Doris Banks, yes, thank you. Sandra says she's heard recently that she's doing well. Well, man, some of you may not know this, but I mean, she lives really close. She's right here on Campbellton, um, on the way to our house. You know, on the left before you get to the school. Actually, before you get to the first road, right? Or is it just, yeah, it's real close. And she's a member over in Ben Hill at the, uh, what is it, the AME Church? Yeah. We love it when she visits us. That's awesome. So, um, any other updates or deletions or additions? Just pray we get out of here. You know, I mean, we got we're supposed to get on a plane, but we gotta we gotta get the test back. Got my fingers crossed. Um, it's funny, uh, people in the Bahamas handle plane rides differently than I do. I mean, I, I always worry about it, but they don't. Hey, Erica, on the phone. We got Erica right here on Patricia's phone listening in. Um, ooh, we're getting the feedback. Oh, it went away. Okay. She might have turned on her speaker for a minute or something. Um, anyone else? Jim, I, I added the Schilling family. I added the Schilling family. Yeah, she passed away. Yeah. Um, yeah. I missed the announcement, but there's a Pennsylvania um, Food Loop is Terminable um, law. They have um, rides that they want to be in. The person from the community has so asked to come for our church. And um, once we get back, I'd love to organize. 
That sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. Back back to Mike and, and Mary. Um, yeah, Jim called me. I called Mary. I left a message. There's been lots of Facebook love, but pour out some more on them if you will. You all probably are Facebook friends with Mike and, and Mary Schilling, so if you would do that, I'd appreciate it. Um, he's been posting some nice things about her, and um, it's worth reading. You love them with an eternal love, and we don't presuppose to remind you of things you already know, but Lord, we care about them too. We're expressing that to you. We're sharing that with you, that our hopes and prayers and desires for them is that, is that they would have healing, that they would recover from their grief, that they would manage with courage and patience the struggles that they are in. And we're, we're remembering uh, the Campbell family and we're remembering uh, the Schilling family, um, Amina's family. Um, there are a number here of people who are in treatment right now for cancer like and, and, and other things uh, like COVID, like Kim and Gloria. We are very concerned about Doris, Paul's friend, uh, Debbie, Patricia's sister, Kathy and Darlene, and uh, Corinne and Jonah. Bless uh, all of these and my parents and all of our families. Bless our church and uh, we've, we've been through such a strange time, we uh, churches in recent years. and in the U.S. and around the world, and uh, we're tired um, of things being weird, um, and we wish that things were more like they were, but we deal with what we have, and good things have come from it, and we ask blessing on all those new friends that we've gained through the Rock group, and Facebook, and Zoom, and all the other, and, and Gene Martino and his church, and Lafayette and, uh, and all, all the people who we've connected with that we wouldn't have known or connected with otherwise and we're grateful for them and your providence in bringing us together. We ask <clears throat> that you would bless uh, Reverend Winston Skinner for his preaching and being with us next week and bless us in our travels and um, Lord we we ask you to bless everyone who will be here next week and share and support. Lord, we also ask that you bless our, our nation and world at this time and show us what peace looks like and let us be instruments of that peace. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, this is our monthly Laity Sunday, and um, we have Jim over at the organ, and we have Paula coming, or standing. I'm not sure which. Which one are you going to do, Paula? I'll stand. Okay. Paula's going to stand, and she's going to give us the page number and the hymnal for our responsive reading. And uh, we ask that uh, she do that at this time. It's page 836, Psalm 116. Page 836, Psalm one. Fifteen. All right. Will you stand, please? Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and faithfulness. Why should we? 
creation say? Where is their God? Our God is in the heavens. Whatever God pleases, God does. Their idols are silver and gold, gold of human hands. They have mouths, but, but do not, not speak. speak. Eyes, but, but do not, not see. They have ears, but do not hear. Noses, but, they, but do not smell. They have hands, but do not feel. Feet, but do not walk. Throats, but make no sound. Those who make idols are like them. So are all who trust in them. O Israel, trust the Lord in the Lord. The Lord is their help and their shield. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. The Lord is their help and shield. You who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. The Lord is their help and shield. We'll remain standing. Our hymn is Amazing Grace, and I've got the page number wrong there. It is 378, I believe. 378. generosity to overflow from you. Let your graciousness and let your grace, amazing as it is, be filled within us to make us givers and make them our cheerfulness and our giving to overflow as well. We ask this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I think what we're going to do is see if Patricia wants to sing. Are you in the mood? She's 50-50 on this. Thank you for doing it. Good morning, Al Rock. Good to see all of you this morning. Um, just thinking, uh, a song just came to mind as we were singing Amazing Grace. 
Um, and it is another version of Amazing Grace. She'll always be my song of praise. Um, Jean, I don't know if you are. She have no staff, but please accompany if you if you do. Amazing Grace shall always be my song of praise, for it was grace that bought my liberty. I do not know just why he came to love me so. He looked beyond my fault and saw my need. I shall forever lift mine eyes to Calvary to view And uh, a scene from a movie where Jesus is about to be pushed off a cliff. Yeah, I said pushed off a cliff. It is actually in your Bible. And guess who those people are? They're the people of his hometown. That's Nazareth. So, Basic Life Interrupted is the name of this, the title of the sermon. Um, <clears throat> of course, we know all about basic life interrupted, don't we? Yep. <laughs> um, and right now, I feel kind of nostalgic about getting basic life uninterrupted back. And I, I guess, I guess it's human nature to want to um, have, for example, enough health. Um, you know, to be able to do the things that you need to do from day to day. You want enough possessions to make life as safe and comfortable from day to day as you can. You work hard to sustain these things, to protect these things. You, um, you want a job that you don't hate. That would be nice. Um, maybe you would like to have some creative endeavors where, you know, you make music or you make art or you write poems. Maybe you, maybe a few hobbies would be nice. Photography, gardening, something. And it might be nice to serve others with a little bit more intentionality, and it might even be nice to just travel a little bit. This is sort of basic stuff, at least it is for me, and I think it is for many people that I know. And we want to have people around us to share our lives with. And we hope they like us a little bit. And it's nice if you like them. And if you're trustworthy and loyal. And 
each of us probably has a few people like that scattered here and there on this planet somewhere. And many of us want to and end up having kids and raising a family. I think that's part of a basic life for many people on earth. The thing is, is that our plans for basic life uh, get interrupted in uh, many ways. I, um, I'm aware of, uh, because of my work in ancestry, and <laughs> you wouldn't believe how many people have had this experience, you know, the whole teen pregnancy thing. And, you know, back in the day, even if it was the 80s, it, it, had, st it, had, it had a stigma around it, and people would go off to, to you know, a, a secret place or a home for unwed mothers. That, that was pretty common back in the 50s, 40s, 30s, maybe before that. Um, the Roman Catholic Church had bunches of those that the nuns ran, you know? And, um, uh, and, and talk about an interruption. I mean, that's not a small interruption. That's kind of a big interruption. And um, I know some people, I've talked to them actually pretty recently online who were adopted and they were looking for their birth parents and they found them. And you'd be amazed how different the stories are about what happens after that. Because the funny thing about being adopted, I think, if you really are burning to know who your biological parents are, it's more than just a basic thing. It kind of interrupts your life. It's, it's, it becomes kind of the thing that's on your heart and mind for a good period of time. And uh, what if you're rejected, you know? Or what if you find them, but they've passed? Or what if you find them and they want to see you now and can't wait and have been looking for you and they love you and an insightfully ever after on Oprah? And that does happen, but I think it happens just as often that maybe it's not so happy. Same goes for unplanned late pregnancies in life. Um, I know that my brother and one of my friends, Butch, they waited till their 40s to have kids. And I think people are waiting later these days. Um, people are waiting for professional reasons or personal reasons. Um, but sometimes um, th those little happy accidents happen when you're 50. And then what do you do? And then you're uh, 60. And I ran into someone online who uh, their parents had a late pregnancy. I think the mom was around 50 and the dad was around 60. And uh, you know what they did? I mean, their, her, little, her little sister said, I'll raise her. It was just amazing. So she was raised by her aunt and uncle who were 10 years younger than her parents who were willing to make that sacrifice and allow that interruption. I've heard, I've heard all kinds of interesting stories of life interrupted by being on, on, uh, on Ancestry. Um, I guess the, the one that I, I hear sometimes that kind of makes me go, ooh, is when someone says, well, I want to know whether I'm Italian or not, and they take the test and their dad's not their biological father. And that's, talk about an interruption, right? So my question this morning to you uh, isn't just about how we cope with interruptions, but what if God is interrupting your life? What do you do then? You might experience it that it's uh, more than an interruption, um, maybe a disruption. You may feel like your life is off the rails now, something going on with God. Um, I'm aware that uh, when Mary went to the temple, Jesus was just 33 days old. Mary went with Joseph to the temple, and here comes an old prophet named Simeon, and he blessed them and said to the mother Mary, this child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too, Mary. I mean, Mary is trying to get her head around the words of, uh, of a prophet that's just told her that her heart's gonna break. And, you know, it really goes back farther than that. Think about just Luke, basic, Luke chapter one. What's going on in Luke chapter one? 
you got Zechariah trying to get his head around a message from Gabriel that these two, in their old age, Sarah and Zechariah, are going to have a child. His name will be John, and he will become John the Baptist, and he will be great. Uh, wow, how do you wrap your head around that? Mary's trying to get her head around a message from Gabriel that she's going to be pregnant, and she's probably only 15 and just engaged and has never been with a man. How is she supposed to explain that? How is she supposed to believe that? Well, that's Luke 1. What an interruption, right? What about Luke 2? Here's Luke 2. In that, Richard, in that region there were uh, shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were terrified. And the angel said to them, Don't be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find the child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace among those whom God favors. What are shepherds supposed to do with that? Talk about an interruption, or maybe we should be talking about disruption. What's Mary, what's Mary doing at the end of chapter 2? She's trying to wrap her head around what her 12-year-old son, who's been missing for three days, just said to her. He said, and I quote, Why were you looking for me? Didn't you know that I must be in my father's house? Uh, you know, even Luke, I mean, Luke, Luke's honest. He actually writes, but they didn't understand what he was saying. And that's the end of the story of Jesus' being left behind in the temple. What about the beginning of, of Luke 3? John the Baptist is preaching. We've skipped forward many years. And he, and he is quoting Isaiah, and he is preaching in the wilderness, and he says, every valley shall be filled. Wow. Every mountain shall and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways will be made plain or smooth. And that sounds radical, like not just an interruption, but maybe more than an interruption, a real disruption, a change of everything. John interrupted the religious status quo. John threatened religious authorities. John outraged King Herod. We want just a basic life, and we want for things to be okay and normal. But we find ourselves reading Luke's gospel, and that's not going on at all. What's going on is unexpected interruptions that disrupt. And the people involved now are doing things that disrupt other people's basic lives, like John challenging the religious system, the religious authorities, and the political leadership. Well, what do we have at the very end of chapter 3 and beginning of chapter 4? I, this is, Jesus here is from heaven, okay? I know Mary and, and, and others heard from Gabriel, but Jesus here is from God. He's being baptized. And he hears the Lord, his heavenly father, say to him, You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. What do you do with that? How heavy is knowing that? How terrifying is that? So you see the pattern now, right? You see the pattern not only in the, just the Bible generally. Uh, you know, the, the Bible is not a manual for, you know, how to keep interruptions from happening. It's not a, a manual for making things go smoothly for you. There's a pattern here of God interrupting people's basic lives and of people often experiencing it negatively as a disruption. So what do you think is going to be next in Luke's Gospel? You, you've seen chapter 1, 2, 3, and 4. What's going to happen next? Well, we're, 
going to see Jesus. And uh, we're going to see Jesus in the, uh, in the, uh, in his going to his own hometown, right? But let's, let's just read the story. It's on the back of your bulletin. power of the Spirit returned to Galilee, and the report about him spread throughout all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up, he went to the synagogue on Sabbath day, as was his custom, and he stood up to read. And the scroll was of the prophet Isaiah. It was given to him, and he unrolled the scroll, and he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he's anointed me to bring the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat out. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed upon him, and he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him, and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? So, that went pretty well, right? Isn't that what you want when you go preach somewhere? You want them to say nice things? Don't you want them to like what you said? Don't you want people to speak well of you when you're gone? You certainly don't want people to speak ill of you while you're, after you leave. So why would Jesus throw a big red monkey wrench into this? You know what he did next, right? You know, our custom is, is don't interrupt people when they're saying nice things about you. And don't insult them for sure. Don't challenge them. Don't throw back in their face their own hypocrisy and blindness, okay? But I want to remind you that Jesus just says just in two, two chapters later in Luke 6, 26, and I quote, Woe to you when all speak well of you. Have you ever thought about what a challenging thing that is to say? Woe to you when all speak well of you. Now, Jesus lived by that because he's going to say something now that will make them not speak well of him. He said to them, Doubtless you will quote me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself, and you will say, Do here and you also in your hometown things that you have heard that, you, that I did in Capernaum. And uh, he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in his, in his people's hometown. So, Doctor, cure yourself, that, and he interprets what that means. It means you, he knows that they are expecting him to do really great things in Nazareth, just like he did in all the other towns of Galilee that had made him famous. Word has gotten around, word has spread. It actually says so. A report about him had spread all through the surrounding countryside. And now he's coming home to Nazareth. It's, it's sort of like, you know, the ticker tape parade when you come home after doing something important in the world. Maybe you were born in a little town in Georgia and you went and you got yourself a gold medal in the Olympics and you come home and they've got parties and parades, right? Well, here comes Jesus. He's now famous. And he came from them and they're proud of that. And yet they also expect since he's one of ours, one of us, He'll at least do what he's done in these other places, and maybe even more for us. Their expectation was that the Messiah would come from them, and maybe this is the guy. They've been yearning, they've been wanting, they've been desiring, and maybe it's Jesus. So he said, truly no prophet is accepted in his own hometown, which is a strange thing to say right after they had just accepted him. They did accept it. But he says, no, you didn't. Because he knows that they accepted him for the wrong reasons. And they don't understand what's happening, what God is doing. So let me continue reading. But the truth is, Jesus said, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah when the heaven was shut up for three years and six months. And 
There was a severe famine over all the land, yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. Okay, that's one example. Then he gives another identical example from Scripture. There were also many lepers in Israel at the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this in the Nazareth synagogue, all were filled with rage. Okay, that's the word that's picked. I didn't pick that word. Rage. Now, what had Jesus just said that would enrage your hometown? All right? Well, what, what could he possibly have said that offended them so much that they are filled with rage at him? They went from all spoke well of him to rage. Well, what about Elijah and Elisha helping a widow and a leper from a foreign country has anything to do with this situation? What, what, would, what would make them hate him for that? Let's look at what they did. How mad were they? They got up and drove him out of the town. They drove him out of his own hometown. And they led him to the brow of a hill on which their town was built, and it is, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. You understand this is an attempted stoning for blasphemy. All right? You can throw stones on people or you can throw people on stones. There's a story about one of the disciples being thrown from the pinnacle of the, from the, the wall of the temple to kill him. And he didn't quite die, so they finished him out by throwing the stones on him where he fell. Uh, you can stone someone by throwing them on rocks, or you can throw rocks on them. This is an attempt at stoning for blasphemy. Now, how mad do you have to be to kill somebody that you know that well? How, how offended do you have to be? I mean, this, Jesus is no stranger. They know him. He grew up there. These people watched him grow up, and he lived there until about the age of 30. They know him very well. At least they think they know him. How bad does something you said have to be for your home congregation to try to kill you for what you just preached? Well, this is a bit more than an interruption in Jesus' ministry, isn't it? It's even more than a disruption. This is, a, this is catastrophic. And Jesus just interrupted more than their basic life. He interrupted their basic self-understanding, their basic hopes, their basic dreams, their basic understanding of God, their basic theology. Clearly, this hometown crowd is experiencing a major something, and they cannot tolerate it. In a nutshell, what, they, what their theology had no room for was that they weren't special to God. Now, that's a hard thing to hear. I tried to teach it to my children when they were really young, you know, because if children think they're special, too special, they start to get too big for their little britches, and everybody needs a little hum, you know, perspective and, and humility. And uh, if you encourage a child's specialness a bit too much um, they become one of those little spoiled brats and they might be one of those little bullies at school and they have to always have their way and be the best and be first so what what if I don't quite know how to ask you this because I don't want I don't I don't want you to take me out on the Clam, Clam, you know, Camelton Road and push me in front of a truck or anything, but what, what if I told you Owl Rock's not that special. Rocky Head's not that special. First Methodist in First Atlanta is not that special. Let's get some perspective here and some humility and remember 
that the Lord can sometimes interrupt what we think we are and what we think we're doing, why, we, why we're here and how things work. And sometimes it's for a reason. And our tendency is to see those interruptions as disruptions. We tend to see them negatively. God knows this whole COVID thing I, we've seen is negatively. On the other hand, I'm amazed at the weird little things going on all around me. With these people on uh, watching live, and we don't even, we've never even met them. One of the people watching messaged me this week and said, I was just diagnosed with prostate cancer. And I don't know how long I have to live, but you and Alarock have meant something to me, and I wish you would come, if you could, to my funeral. We are oddly finding God at work in this interruption, in this disruption, in this mess. And, and I wonder what we're being taught, and I wonder what we're learning, and I wonder if we're listening. What if I... What if I told you it's probably not the Lord's plan to make sure that we always stay the same or that we always get what we like or get our way? What if, what if it's not God's plan for people to always say nice things about you and for everybody to like you? What if I told you it's probably not the Lord's plan uh, to avoid interrupting your plans? <laughs> That's one of my favorites. What if, what if it's not the Lord's plan to avoid interrupting your plans? But instead, you know, they say the Lord works in mysterious ways. What if uh, the unwelcomed interruptions and disruptions that we experience as rejection or negativity or bad will or bad luck are instead the Lord at work in your life and in the life of this church and in this world. I mean, is that, is that wrong? Is it too blasphemous to consider that the Lord comes for everyone and that the Lord loves all and there is no special people except for all God's people are special. Is that too crazy to say? If it is, I'm, I'm ready to blaspheme this morning because the Lord, I've seen the Lord reach out in the strangest and most wonderful ways to people who don't deserve it, to people who are fighting it. I even have a friend who, um, who for 45 years now has been saying no to God. And not too long ago, and I don't know what changed his mind. It, it, it was the littlest interruption. I don't want to give it away who he is. It was the littlest interruption. It was just one thing that went wrong. It was just one, it was just one little glitch. One little misstep. And everything changed. You know, God could do that for you. God may have already done that for you. <laughs> Maybe you just need to look and see and understand that the thing that you have been avoiding, the thing that you've been resisting, the thing that you have been, that's been killing you, that's been bothering you, is the very thing that uh, God is using to interrupt your preconceptions and your plans. Maybe God has something better for you than you planned for yourself. You never know. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for being with us this morning, both in the uh, live stream and uh, here in the sanctuary. Our closing hymn, we thank Jim again for playing this morning with Gene. Uh, our closing hymn is Take My Life and Let It Be. That's 399. And let's stand together and sing.
you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. We will see you all uh, Wednesday morning. If you want to go see Gene Martino, we're going to skip Wednesday night though uh, with our Wednesday night panel. Patricia and I will be in Nassau and we'll be thinking about you. Hope you'll think about us. Uh, see you next Sunday. Same time, same channel. The Al Rock Group at 10 a.m. God bless you. Bye-bye.